I'm going to share with you 10 tips, 10 ways of beating or following, depending on your point of view, the eight bar rule. What is the eight bar rule? It simply says that in your music, every eight bars, something should change. Now, if you're already composing music, the chances are you are probably using some of these ideas subconsciously, instinctively using your musical sensibilities. But I think it's always nice to have a list of suggestions to call on should you need them. Now, with these tips, I'm going to give you one or in many cases more than one musical example so you can see exactly what they do. So this video may be quite long. You might want to grab a beverage. Now, I don't know who came up with the 8 bar rule. I suspect it was possibly a record company's A&R person who was tired of listening to repetitive two and four bar loops. The object is to maintain or even increase interest for the listener. And that is something which I think we should keep in mind whenever we are composing music. Unless, of course, you are composing the music entirely for your own interest. Now, I suspect a lot of us, most of us probably compose music for our own enjoyment, which is absolutely fine. I compose music because I enjoy it, but I would also like to share it with other people. So if you intend to share your music with other people, I think it's important that you try to make it as interesting as possible. You want to make them think even at a subconscious level. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I wonder what's coming next. Make it interesting. Make them want to continue listening. Now, two things before we get going. This is called the eight bar rule, but as in many things in music, it is absolutely not a rule. It is a set of guidelines, suggestions, so you can follow them or adapt them or ignore them as you wish. Now, it's called the eight bar rule, but some of the, these ideas you might want to implement every four bars or 16 bars, or you might just want to drop some of these ideas in at random points throughout your music. We'll get onto that a little bit later. So don't take the eight bar rule as gospel, just as ideas and suggestions. And the second thing is, going through these musical examples, we will come across what are called transitions. These are generally just little pieces of sound or a short music statement, perhaps a one beat drum fill to take us from one section of the music into the next section. I'll point these out as and when we come to them. Probably the most common transition, and it is so common it has probably become a cliche, but I think it's a cliche for a reason. It works and it's very effective. And this is the reverse cymbal sound, the shh. Oh, that was good, wasn't it? And this is used to lead from one section into another. It lets the listener know, oh, something's coming up here. And I have used this in many pieces. So let's get going. The first tip is simply to add another part. Now, most music, certainly electronic music, is built up in this way. You never throw all your vegetables into the pot at the same time. Even if you are making a casserole, that's probably not a good analogy. But music, electronic music in particular, is generally built up by adding different layers. You might start with a drum track, add a bass line, add a chord track, add some harmonies, some pads, something like that. So you build it up over a series of bars. Now I'm sure you probably do this already. Most of my pieces do this in some way or another. This is so common, it's probably not necessary to give you a specific example, but I will give you an extreme example. And that is from a piece called Slayers. That is Layers with an S on the front. Now it's called Layers because as you can see here, this is my working copy. I generally don't colour the parts. that I coloured a couple of parts here just to help me with the arrangement. But this just adds layer after layer after layer after layer. If you want to know why it's called Slayers, then watch the original video. I think I'll probably give you a big clue. Incidentally, the links to each of the pieces that I use in these tips will be in the description if you want to watch any of them in their entirety. Let's start from here, by which time most of the layers have built up. And then the 
raccoon comes in. And then even more layers. So the second tip is now having added parts simply to remove a part. So this is an extract from a piece called Beautiful Dreams. So we start and just about everything is plain. And then after it's been cleaned for a little while, we take out some parts. you a little while like this and then it actually goes into a, another section. This example is from a piece called Blaze. It's a low fine piece and just about everything is plain at this point and then as you can hear some parts drop out. And this final example is from a piece called Dark Water. Again, all the parts are firing on full cylinders. There's a bass drum hit every two bars. And you can hear as we enter the transition, the parts don't just stop, they sort of slowly disappear. So this is another way to remove parts without necessarily having an absolute cutoff. Tip number three, change some instrumentation. This is possibly more common with orchestral arrangements. It's pretty easy to substitute a flute line, for example, uh, for a clarinet or a, a horn or something like that. But we can also do this with electronic music. We can do this with any sort of music. So here's an example from a piece called Champions, which I actually wrote back in the 1990s. And everything was created on the Yamaha SY77. And this is, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek football anthem. So let's start with the main tune. And can I just direct your attention to these little flute fills? And then you can hear the instrumentation changes to pizzicato strings. Because footballers are ballerinas dancing about the football ground, aren't they? But this gives the piece a totally different feel. So tip number four is to add additional instrumentation. Now this isn't necessarily the same as adding a new track. Again, this is something which is probably more common in an orchestration, but it doesn't have to be. The example I'm going to use here is from a piece called A Taste of Italy. It has, I hope, very much an acoustic feel, although everything, of course, was created electronically. The whole piece is very short, but I'll start at the beginning. It has a one bar introduction. And then we get into the piano theme. After a couple of bars, the theme continues, but it is doubled with another instrument. And that adds a little bit more interest to the piece. Skipping forward, the next time the theme plays, this time a cello has been added to the accompaniment. Tip number five, include a drop. Now, drops are very common or an almost an essential part of a lot of EDM. 
but you use the idea of a drop in all sorts of music. Now, some of these ideas you might think overlap a little bit. What's the difference between a drop and removing a part? Well, to my mind and my ears, in any case, I look upon a drop as something which is more intentional than simply removing a track. It pairs back the arrangement to a more minimal state, perhaps just a drum line or a drum and a bass line. So this example is from a piece called Nowhere to Hide and we join it where just about everything is in full flow. And then some of the parts drop out. I've got to use a couple of examples from this next piece, which is called One Secret. I think I call this an ambient techno track. So here we have everything running along. We'll listen to this reverse cymbal effect, which is a transition, and then into what I would call, it's a sort of a drop where everything drops out apart from this sequence to line. There is no more in back. So there was another reverse cymbal sound coupled with what I call ear candy, the brum sound. We'll get onto that in a moment. So while I've got this piece up and running, I'd like to share a couple of other sections of it, both containing transitions. So the first one you will hear, So here again we have the rump sound, which I would call ear candy, but here it is used as a transition. And then, after this has been run a little while, we get to this massively long reverse symbol effect, which again is another transition. And these transitions can all be used to enter a drop or another section of music. And in this section, we use a riser as a transition element. Wait for it. Wait for it. That feels so good. And then we can build the track up again. Right, tip six is to change key. That sounds pretty straightforward. There are many different ways to do it. I'm going to give you three examples here. This is a Berlin School piece written entirely on a free instrument called Chrysalis. This is the main tune, or one of them, and then we go into what I call the transition section. And the transition section plays, and then it just changes key. And then we get back to the music, in the new key of course. Now this next example is from a song I wrote back in the 1980s called Where Were You? So this is the chorus. Now coming up we're going to get the dominant seventh chord on the piano. And then we are straight into the key change. Wonderful. It's a lovely way to do it. I'm sure this has been used in many other songs as well. I just thought this was very effective and worth sharing. Now, I didn't write the arrangement, so I can't take any credit for the flute lines. These are what I would call fills. So we'll talk more about fills a little bit later. Flutes seem to be very popular fill instruments. 
And for this final example, this is slightly different. It's from a piece of music I wrote for a game on the BBC computer called Future Shock. Now with it having a sort of futuristic title, I wanted to create something which is slightly futuristic, although still keeping some sort of melody. So it is, I think, quite tuneful. The odd part about it, it is written in a variety of, of time signatures. See if you can work out the bar divisions as you're listening to it. But as far as key changes go, it's just a really short tune, but on each repetition it changes key. Now we actually can't remember how many key changes I put in the piece or exactly how it was handled in the game. But I thought the key changes gave it a little edge, a little bit like a shepherd's tone, you know, those sounds which just seem to be going upwards and upwards and upwards forever. So this is another example of change in key, just going straight for it. So tip seven is add a counter melody. Now, this is one of my most absolute favourite things to do. Now, some pieces lend themselves to this more than others, so don't imagine at all that you need to put this in every piece of music. But if you can, I think it adds just a, such a special element because there are two tunes, two specific tunes that the ear, the listener, is listening to and needs to concentrate on. So there is a sort of juxtaposition to the listen to this tune or that tune or the combination of tunes. I really like to hear this sort of thing in a piece of music. So I have three examples. The first example is from a piece called Christmas a Lullaby and it's essentially played on a music box but the second tune comes in on a violin. So you can concentrate on the violin and listen to that tune, but if you tune your ears to the music box, then you can hear the music box tune. Now, when you think about counter melodies, you might think of ooh, classical counterpoint and stuff like that. But I don't think there's any of that in here, at least not consciously. I just wrote two tunes which work well together. This next example is from a piece called Goodbye, Mr. Palmer. You get a bonus point if you can work out the Mr. Palmer reference. And you might get a clue from the style of the music and also from the style of the video. You might want to watch the entire piece. But in any event, the accompaniment is played on the piano, there's a tune on the piano, and also a second tune coming in on the saxophone. So we'll join this just where the two pieces start to play together. So you will hear the piano tune and the saxophone tune. And there's something I think a little bit interesting about how these two tunes work together. Have a listen. Now these two tunes do stand up on their own, but when they come together, they take turns. So we have a saxophone, a piano, and saxophone, and piano, and so on. So they are complementing each other and filling in each other's spaces. This third example is from a piece called Sunday Morning. And here the counter melody is played by a cello, so it's in the bass register.
if you want adding a counter melody there is more than one way to do it and they don't have to share the same space as the main melody right i think this is number eight add fills to my mind fills are not the same as a counter melody they just as the name suggests fill in a bit of a space in the tune I'll give you three examples here. For one of them, I would refer you back to the Champions piece and the flute fills floating around in between the main melody line. These are just little runs or arpeggios. They are not, I would say, fully fledged tunes. So they are not counter melodies at all. So for the exact example, I'm going to use something which is slightly over the top. What a surprise. Um, this was another piece which I wrote for the BBC computer, for a BBC computer game. And it is John Philip Sousa, The Stars and Stripes Forever. Now, he only had two channels on the BBC to work with, so I played the main theme on one and went overboard with the second channel, producing a lot of flute-type fills and trills and so on. So again, these are fills, they are not secondary tunes. And the third example is from, it's another Christmas piece called Hooked on Christmas, which is basically a collection of carols with a disco beat underneath. So we'll start with We Three Kings. Da, 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 da. So that's a fill. There it is again. And here we join ye merry gentlemen. Yes, there's that little fill again. I was obviously in this little brass stubby filly mood when I was putting that together. But also I think in a small way it helps cement the piece together by using similar sounds and similar rhythms throughout. Tip number nine add another section. Now I'm pretty sure at whatever stage you are at as a composer you have thought about doing this. But judging by the number of tutorial videos about this on YouTube it seems to be something which many people struggle with. It is not the easiest thing in the world to do but it is something which you need to do in order to keep your music interesting. You can only extend a four bar loop for so long before the listener's ear craves some sort of interesting change. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. The first is from a piece called Carousel, which, as its name suggests, is a piece of fairground music. You can probably tell that from the instrumentation. So we start with the first section, the first tune. And then it goes seamlessly into a different section. So there's nothing outstanding about this. It is using exactly the same instruments as were used before in the previous section. It's just playing a different tune. So that is probably one of the absolutely simplest ways to add a different section. Just don't change the instrumentation. Just write a slightly different tune. But there are other ways, of course, of doing this. Now, you're probably familiar with a typical song structure. You might have an intro, a verse, chorus, middle eight, verse, chorus. Lots of variations on those sort of sections. In instrumental music, we probably call them A sections and B sections. And there are dozens of different ways you can put these different sections together in combination. Some pieces of music, for example, might have a very simple structure like A, B, A, B, and that's it. Others might have something slightly more complicated like A, B, A, C, A. I guess an extreme example of this would be a piece of music which contained a lot of sections which didn't repeat at all, such as A, B, C, D, E, F, 
G however many sections the piece wanted to contain. So the piece I want to highlight here is called Roshan and this contains a lot of different sections although they are closely tied in various ways harmonically and melodically I think and some of them do repeat throughout the piece. So this is the introduction sung by a single solo choir voice. <laughs> And then after a 2 beat pause we get into a different section. That is what I would call a piece of ear candy. So a little bit later. So if we skip forward a little bit we come out of that section and go into this section. Then there's a very slight development on that section which takes us into a choir. So this piece contains a lot of different sections which I think complement each other and develop the piece as it goes on. Now I generally think it's a good idea for different sections to complement each other and work well together and sound as if they are part of the same piece but it doesn't always have to be so tightly knit if you like. So here's an example which may offer a little bit of a surprise. This piece is called Traveller. That's a fairly slow ambient piece, just moving gently along as many ambient pieces do. And then we have a rest and I'm sort of wondering what's going to happen next. Oh, we're at the metal guitar in space. What's this about? And then we drift back into the sedateness and calmness of space. Now that may have been a little bit left field but obviously I think it works but that's just to show that you don't necessarily in my opinion at least have to develop something which feels so closely knit. Now here is another example in the same vein. This is from a piece called Urban Clown which is another very short piece. But we'll start near the beginning with what I think is a circus-like piece, but perhaps with just a slightly dark edge to it. Yeah, Candy? No messing about, it just jumps into a totally different section. But there's more. It gives way to this, which has a sort of slithering sound. I think the coherent aspects here are the slightly creepy vibe which I hope both parts give off. So I think it's nice if different sections have some sort of cohesive quality which binds them together but on the other hand I don't think it's absolutely essential certainly not for all pieces. Obviously it depends on the effect you are going for. 
Finally, tip number 10, which we've mentioned uh, several times throughout this video, ear candy. Now, you probably know what these are anyway. They can be anything, just little fills, little arpeggios, little runs, a little drum hit, a little sound. This is just to add a little bit of interest to a section of music which might need it. In one of my last pieces, the Ambient Berlin School piece, I did a track walkthrough of that. If you want to check that out, link to all these things will be in the description. But in that track breakdown, I explain how I added the ear candy parts to the piece. So I think we've heard enough ear candy examples throughout this video, but I just want to play one more piece and see if you can guess what the ear candy is. This is called Cuba. All right. So you can use little vocal shouts and snippets like that as ear candy. And I put them in the Cuba piece too. I'll add a little bit more interest and give it a perhaps a little bit more of a live feel. So that's my 10 tips for beating or following the head bar rule. Let me know if you have any other tips for maintaining interest throughout a piece of music. Keep in mind the main goal, which is to keep your music fresh and interesting for the listener. But the most important thing is remember to have fun and enjoy your composing and music making. So if you've enjoyed this video, perhaps you would like to consider subscribing to the channel, ringing the bell. Thank you. So YouTube will tell you when I post a new video. And if you would like to click the big thumb, that would be massively appreciated. It is really is a big help. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you again very soon in the next video.